Good to see all these wonderful, familiar names. Hi, Kaylee. Hi, Rick. Hey, Alonzo. Oh, and Rick brought his class. Hi, everyone. So great to see you all. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Nice. Oh, yes. I love it. And Lucas and excellent. And I see some names I don't recognize, which is exciting. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is great. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us on a Wednesday afternoon, or if you're in Greece, it's midnight, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> um, we are so pleased to be joined today um, by Apostolos Zardevas, um, who is, joins us from the Focus School of Photography in Greece. Um, we met at a National Portfolio Day, and we've had some really great connections this year. And I'm so pleased that we can host an artist talk today. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Apostolos. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, Helen, for inviting me. Uh, I thank very much for the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, the MFA program that invited me for this talk. And uh, we also had a very good collaboration in a previous, like, uh, let's say, like a lesson we had. We, we, we went very fine. And hopefully I'm looking forward to the exhibition this summer that uh, it will go on. So I think it's a very nice start. It's also, I thank everybody who had taken some of his time in order to see me here today to present my work and start talking around things like that, which is very kind of you. And uh, what uh, this today's talk is, is a small presentation of my work, of a big part of my work. And uh, to before I start like presenting, I, would, I can say one or two things about myself. My name is Apostle Zerdevas. I'm based in Athens, Greece. So right now here, as Ellen said, it's 12 o'clock. And basically, I have been like a, pra a practicing artist for almost the last 20 years. And I have done a series of exhibitions in Greece and abroad. And basically, my education has been, uh, uh, I have studied photography in Greece, and I have continued my studies basically in uh, the UK, where, where I obtained a, an MFA in Fine Arts. And now I continue my studies, basically, I'm, tr I'm, tr I'm reading for a PhD in uh, the University of Reading, uh, also in fine arts, and which is, it has to do with the representation of political violence, contemporary art, etc., which is one of the main focuses of my work. Not the sole one, but it's one of the main themes of my work. Actually, besides like being a, a practicing artist, I make my living as an educator, where I I I am like a head of studies in Focus School of Photography and New Media and School, which is a small private school that focuses more on lens-based media and media art. We have like a two-year program in Athens. And also, I, from time to time, because it's not like my main occupation, I act as a curator for Athens Photo Festival, which is a pretty big festival of photography in Athens. And also, for the last two years, I'm also part of and curating things from plat uh, from Tilt Platform, which is a, a festival of video art based in uh, Corinthia, Lutraki, and in Athens. But we, we are just starting in, from the last two or three years. So my, without, uh, to not continue speaking that much, I will start my like miserable PowerPoint presentation as everybody else does. So uh, I'm ready to. S Hopefully, it will work. Uh, okay. So uh, does it, everybody see the, the screen? Yes. Okay, so it works. So, my name is Apostle Zerte. For this presentation, I, I decided to have a title that's a bit like, I think it explains some some part of my work. The, this like premature explosion that it combines some notions of 
maturity and not maturity and also like some notions that have to do with image violence and things like that. Before I start presenting what I do, uh, this is my natural state. If somebody sees me in Greece, logically would see me with a, a, an iced coffee in my hand because this is usually ha how I am like uh, wandering around the school. And this is usually what I do. I mean, uh, I, I'm around in exhibitions, either that or from someone else. This is one exhibition that we have done with my with Fox Photography School, together with me and some students and my father and some other teachers. So, you know, this is what I normally do. This is how I live, basically. This is how I'm, uh, I make ends meet. And uh, what I, I have to say that I think was very important for me, I was very lucky that when I was young, uh, when, I start, when I started my studies, that was in uh, before 2000, it was 1998. Uh, uh, so then it was like, uh, I was very fortunate because I had to, I had some teachers that were very open about what photography means, especially by the standards of that era. I mean, speaking 20 years beforehand. So, I mean, I was very, there was very open presentations and the, like, uh, there was a, a, a very open uh, attitude towards what photography can be and w what also can constitute an, a, a work of art. I, I wouldn't say that now this is advanced by art standards, by, but by, by the standards of living in a small periphery country as as Greece 25 almost years ago. This thing was very. This thing was very important. It was not that common, especially in in a photography kind. Let's say in the photography small like uh, community. So when I was young, one one of the first like uh, I would say that that were like uh, one of my major uh, inspiration was generally what we could say in a very blunt term like conceptual art and conceptual photography. One of the main reasons, I would say, it was like that I'm naturally very clumsy. So when I was wor working with film, things usually didn't go very well. It was very difficult for me to solve the equation of to make technically good photos and make very interesting uh, and have a, an interesting theme at the same time, right? To, to, to manage to solve both the concept and the form at the same time it was very difficult for me and the technical aspects. So I think for me it was a, the idea that you can make interesting art that, as this artwork from Joseph Kosuth that, that can be conceptual art that you don't have to be a great photographer or to make a very fascinating image. For me it was very liberating in a way. So looking at First, at some more classical, like let's say, conceptual uh, work of the like 70s, and then being in touch with what, what I could say, like uh, uh, the contemporary photography, let's say, uh, of of the 1980s in uh, in the UK, and part of the young British artist movement, was very integral for me to like to start formulate what it could be very interesting as work. So, I mean, some another idea that I found very interesting, it was to incorporate text in the photos. This is a work by Hannah Collins, which although it's very massive, I, didn't, I haven't done very much that massive works. So, I mean, it, it, it was one of the ideas that, I mean, were like, ah, I can connect text with images. So this also. And what also what also I find very interesting idea it was the idea that like this uh, Victor Bruggin's piece which is called Office at Night, which is a reference to Hopper's work, basically with the same name. So basically, is the idea that you combine photography with diagrams or with other graphistic elements. So I mean, I mean, it's like you can feel free to shape photography in a new way, or, or at least don't feel bound, but if a photographic image is interesting or not, or do not feel bound by, by the nature of the photographic image in itself. 
So my first work that I, I could consider part of, like, let's say, my mature work was the series that I made in 2001 that's called Where Are the Biscuits? Basically, it was a series of photographs that I took then with a with a two megapixel digital camera. It was very, very, very low fi digital camera. That was that were the almost the only available digital cameras back then. And I make a series of let's say what I was calling them esoteric landscapes. And I was combining them with small phrases on the top which was of my own making the phrases. So, I mean, I was speaking a bit about what is something that could be from philosophical to unimportant, something that works with the image or, constantly, or contrasts what you see. So I was trying to make this connection. For some reason, although I was still based in Greece, generally the relation with language I have, I was always much more easy for me to express myself in the English language. This is also perhaps because of my dyslexia might play a part in it, I would say. So these images, they tend to be from like very, let's say, focused to very abstract and play with this thing about the abstraction of meaning and image and things like that. And these usually are, are printed very big, in almost one meter to 70 meters. So, I mean, they don't have really a very good quality of the image. You play with the thing you see that the, the text you see in the front and the image in behind, and this creates a relationship. Another point of view: this is a work by Helen Chadwick that she, she was a photographer, sculptor. English sculpture that she was very prominent in the 80s, 90s. Unfortunately, she passed away in 95, if I remember well. And one other work that I made when I was back in Greece before I left to do my MFA in 2003 was this work, which is called The Washing Machine. It's not directly referring to the previous work that I presented by Helen Chadwick, but it's like you could say that it might have been an influence, which this work was like um, this small phrase that usually you could say come from some uh, elements of everyday life. And I presented them as being washed up in the washing machine and working at the same time. So I mean, this was a bit like, uh, a, again, it was a, a try to leave, leave far away from what we say the photographic image. So the, I always had this, especially in my first, I would say, like 10 years of my art painting, very loose, uh, let's say, relationship with the photographic image. I also, it was my first day that I, um, the first work that was trying to vibrate or some concepts like that. So what I wanted to, to actually simulate was like simulate, let's say, everyday like concepts that we have in everyday life with a washing machine that everything being, is being washed, washed over and it's complicated into the same like, uh, let's say, mass of thought or in a way, how thoughts or phrases or or ideas in a day, let's say, die out a bit. In 2002, I moved around. I moved for one year in the UK. So that basically was a very big change in the way I brought my work. I started an MA in uh, Chelsea School of Fine Art. Chelsea School of Art and Design. Now it's part of the University of Arts in London. And uh, the department still exists. I mean, and, uh, and there I had like this, you know, I just moved away from home basically for the first time in my life, in my 23s. I go to a very different environment. I'm being faced with a very different critique regimen. I mean, especially then, 
the, MF, the MFAs in the UK were very competitive, both in terms if it was very difficult to go to one, I mean, to get accepted to a good university, but also they were very competitive in their critiques. So, I mean, this was something very new to me, like some somebody saying, ah, your work is not good, or do not do that, or do this other thing. I mean, this was something very new. I mean, we were much more, let's say, innocent in a way in Greece. And also we were not accustomed for other students to to like comment or negative really on our work, which also is a very different experience from the teacher telling you, ah, this isn't good or not good. There, one of the things that I, I saw that it literally changed my view about art in a way, about what it can be can represent basically, was this series of Gerald Richter that is uh, that's called October 1897-7, which basically it's a series of paintings, a very famous like actually series, that that depict the death of uh, the, the su suicide, murder. There are many opinions about that. Uh, of uh, imprisoned rough members in uh, 1977, and basically it's made. There are a series of paintings, huge paintings that they are made out as a reference to like uh, some photos that they were printed in the newspaper. And this blurry aesthetics is like how you can represent first something that has to do with what we say like um, revolutionary politics or revolutionary violence and how this can be rendered into a work of art, the result of it, or what is this process? I mean, this was the first time that I thought like, yeah, hmm, I'm interested in politics, I'm interested in revolutionary politics. Hmm, this can be a focus in my art. This can be part of my art, art practice. I haven't never thought about it until then. And uh, as a result of the series, my MFA thesis was basically, it was called Terror, very simply. It was basically based on the teachings of uh, a revolutionary anarchist uh, called Sergei Netzaev. He's not that famous, but he's very famous of that he was preaching a very militant like approach to life. And he was basically a nihilist revolutionary in that sense of the world, I mean, what it meant back then in politics, that he lived in Russia before the, like, the, he was a contemporary of Bakunin before, like 30 or 40 years before the Russian Revolution. And he actually has written a very small part, partlet that basically he said, like, this is like uh, what a revolutionary what uh, should be. And what I presented as part of my work was some of his like tellings as read but they were written on a series of co empty corporate classroom whiteboard this is like in order for someone to like be able to understand what is written on them and this was presented in a series of like the space of the school was very warehouse like so you were going to these rooms so they were like these balaclavas some videos playing and these like uh, writings on, on whiteboards that they were like describing what the revolutionary must be. What I was very uh, also fascinated by that is like because it's like although his writings have lived through the ages and have become like a reference point, she was actually a very failed revolutionary. And I think this for me started like bridging the idea also like what this art has to do with it, how art can like uh, communicate with such things that they're very transgressive or they're very practical or, they, or they, they speak about violence, which are generally, in my opinion at least, it's not very close to that. And I, I think this is what I was trying to describe in a way. Wait a minute, Wait a minute. sorry. Okay was that, um, for example, art cannot be really like a part of such a process in reality. It's, it can pretend to be, but it becomes a bit pretentious. This thing, for example, this part of an installation 
was like uh, this one again it, like was in a, in an open space and these were instructions of how to make how they were making molotov cocktails in the second world war and in front of it there were various uh, beards from all over the world and plus everything was uh, uh, like uh, pure with gasoline so I mean, you could also smell the gasoline around so I mean, it was kind of again like like something that's something between an advertisement like what is what is like a bottle of beer it's an everyday object that it could potentially be turned like into a revolutionary weapon but in reality in without the confidence of like an art space or an exhibition space or a university space this cannot really happen this is doesn't doesn't happen and uh, part uh, and now there is like a, a video that basically presents the exhibition some of like the videos they were playing it i think it will play right now hopefully okay <laughs> Most of the videos are loops, so you won't see, you won't see many different things. And basically, if you saw these more floppy drives, in these drives there were instructions of how to turn like a floppy drive in a small like uh, disk, let's say something like that. And here, this is the main video, actually, the presentation, you could say. It's so, sort of a performance-like video. And another one that I'm sitting in my then apartment and just waiting for nothing to happen, basically. So, I mean, one also, like, I would say, like, one of my ideas were like that it was also like the idea that the revolutionary always waits for something nothing happens or it happens when you're at least expecting it after that i returned back to greece and part of the uh, let's say aftermath of this war was a series of exhibitions that i will present you a bit briefly that happened from 2006 to 2011 that were very close in terms of like thought and what they were representing. 
Uh, this was one that uh, it was done in an apartment in uh, a galaxy that uh, it was together, it was part of like uh, a, a series or a group exhibition that I did, I done with some uh, other artists then, some of them are that they're in the meeting room right now. And I mean, it was, uh, it was a very nice experience. It was the first time I was seeing this kind of work in Greece. This also like is, uh, it was like a, 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 an exhibition that was called Preface to the Legal Diarist Exhibition. It was, a, it was a solo show, a small solo show that had a series of basically photographs. That it was, they were placed in like in a deserted like bike shop, basically. And this is like the main theme of the exhibition was a monument to Legudarist International. For those who cannot understand the concept, Legudarist is like, it was a term that it also exists in, uh, in evolutionary politics and it's similar to the term like that's it, what's presented like in uh, the finance markets, like when you liquidate all your assets, when you, when you basically, you like uh, leave your uh, your ideas in order to gain profit. I mean, you betray your ideas in order to have some profit. So I mean, this is like what was the idea about again the impossibility of of any sort of like evolutionary thought within an art space. And this was like a bit of a snapshot. This was called the exhibition was a snapshot of what I was doing at the time. Again, very similar in a way. And uh, about what is present and what's not. And in that sense, it, is, it was the first time that I started really working with the internet a bit. I mean, this was the age that I started being like, hmm, there may be some much more interesting things from what I'm thinking, or visual imagery that I might find in the internet that I, may, I might be able to make it work for me as an artist. And uh, one of the generally one of the artists that was also part like of my of of the text that they were accompanying my thesis back in 2003 was like the critical art symbol. Probably since you are from the US, might people might know them. If you don't know them, they're a very interesting uh, group of artists for someone to look into because they have been very have done very significant like uh, activist art throughout the 80s until today there has been, there have also have been uh, a part of a very publicized uh, trial that was brought against them from bioterrorism in 2003 so i mean they have a very interesting idea about how art and activism can uh, exist together or they can be like uh, how uh, thought can be very thought-provoking and proven dangerous in a way. And after that, in 2015, I tried to have a more like photographic approach to what I was doing. And I envisioned the, pro the project that's called Towards Synthesis Militia. This project is based on a book, basically, or a pamphlet, I would say, that's called Towards Citizens Militia, Anarchist alternative to NATO, the Warsaw Pact, and basically it's a guerrilla manual about how you're supposed to conduct guerrilla warfare. The very interesting thing it, it's based on a series of, of very interesting illustrations and diagrams. This is the original. How is the original book, which is which is again is a, it has a complicated story. It's basically it was printed in Spain under the Franco dictatorship in 72. And it's a weird book because it's kind of like a ripoff of uh, manuals of the Irish Republican Army, messed up with some new ideas. And it's, it's a weird thing a bit. And also it's interesting because it's one of the very few books that present an idea against both like the NATO or the Warsaw Pact. I mean, it goes beneath, it doesn't try to take side one or the other. So many of, of like these diagrams there inside, they look like that and they have titles like this is 
a diagram of how to attack the supply lines, for example. It goes like that. And I combined that with a series of portraits. I took some portraits of my friends, students, that they were everyday people living in Greece, in Greece, and I took them basically in my where I live, in the kitchen, uh, let's say, in the part of the kitchen where I live. And I mean, this series of portraits try to portray these people to in a way that's very like neutral, but at the same, it implies that everybody can can be a part of a militia in a way. And I, I think this is so, something that for me right now, unfortunately, becomes again relevant seeing the events in Ukraine. Also, I have to point out that being from Greece, conscription in Greece is mandatory or sort of mandatory. Uh, and you have to go to the army or you have to try to evade it. Uh, so, I mean, this is a reality. I mean, even it's not, I wouldn't say it's dangerous in Greece and right now, but I mean, you understand that there's always this possibility. And it's, it's title of its portrait is basically what is kind of like the, what it is, is being described in the T-shirt. It's like attacking the power system, ambush of single vehicles, destroy the transformers. Transformers, they mean the transformers of the electricity. It's basically like you take a series of diagrams that are related to sabotage and you give them a face in a way. And you play with that. And this is how this was also like this is like an installation view in order to like uh, see the size they were, they were printed very big it was one meter and a half one meter and 20 i mean so they are pretty big i'm framed pinned on the wall and in one place there was also like this uh, let's say pink bucket with all the all like the t-shirt so i mean everybody could go there and take a t-shirt and see how it works and see how it is. Part of like, uh, one of the other artists I would say that started, was always an inspiration was Richard Prince. Uh, and basically was one of the inspiration I would say that about the idea of reappropriating work. There are some elements of appropriation also in that work and in previous in the previous work, you would say, by appropriating the ideas of the, the writings of and things like that. But in a way, I started thinking like, hmm, if, for example, Richard Prince can take something like a, an archetype right, as the cowboy, um, this might be interesting, something I should try on as an artist. And in 2015, I produce a series of, I would say, works, because not a single work, that's called State, that exists both as a book and as an exhibition. And basically, it is a, a series, it's, it's both an exhibition, an installation, a slideshow, and a book. It works at the same time. It is a series of pictures I took from online videos that basically are the history of the Islamic State from 2000, its origins before it was an Islamic State, to basically its end, that interferes also within that. It's, it it's also has a, a small storytelling about a Canadian volunteer that went and died for the Islamic State. They are con combined works, and they also exist as a, like a dummy book that I made with another uh arts and graphic design that is a friend of mine called mk that we haven't like really published it but i mean it exists but i can show you how it looks a bit and this is basically is re -photograph, i'm rephotographing the propaganda videos but you know you reframe you sometimes leave the uh, some movement, you, you, you leave the screen, you decide what kind of narrative is, is going to be through these images in the end. So it creates a bit of a rendering of something that is, is already exists. And I think it, it pushes the idea to what extent something from such a, a politically and uh, emotionally charged material can be transformed into something else. 
and if war can be part of it. Sort of, I could say that this is also part of my PhD, a big idea about it, how this works. And it also plays a bit about the differences of the moving, the still image. I mean, like, the moving image has a narrative that's much more clear, while the still image, it's more like a code, it's not really a language, it doesn't have always a very strong narrative. So, I mean, it makes you, it makes you, like, think in a different way. It makes your mind, your mind wander a bit about what you are saying, or it, you try to you see the details. And I think this is interesting. And also it's a bit of a contrast between some of the images not being very clear, but at the same time presented as like, as like a still image. And uh, one also like work of an uh, artist that I admire very much, and I was very, uh, by time I was very, Glad that I have met him once. It's also like the work of Naim Muhaimin. I don't pronounce his name right. He's a Bangladeshi artist that lives in the USA. That he has made a very a series of very inter interesting films and videos. And one of them is called about. Uh, it's called the United Red Army. And it's also a very interesting subject in itself because United Red Army, which is uh, for most people that don't know, it is basically an organization that existed in the 70s in the in uh, the Japan, and many of its members then they 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 make like a terrorist organization called the Japanese Red Army, which is basically the first organization that made, let's say, a propaganda video about the revolution in a sense like, like a terrorist organization and not a state. And it's, some of its members were filmmakers, so also they have a very direct philosophy about it, and it's very interesting. And these videos were made in Lebanon, not in uh, uh, Japan, where some of the members were fighting for the Palestinian cause. One sub-part of this like uh, series of the series State is State al Kanadi, which says describes a bit about this small story of a white male uh, volunteer that basically there is a propaganda video about him that he says how he joined ISIS and in the end you also see his death. It's very bizarre, it's very weird in a sense because it's also very interesting because in the start it starts by seeing like found food that they have incorporated in their video of Canada, which is kind of, you see like this tundra like light uh, landscapes, uh, snow, plains, you know, beautiful cities. And then suddenly you go to like the grim reality of, uh, let's say, uh, the, f uh, the Syrian civil war itself. This image basically is himself dead he, he's the guy that, that um, i mean he's even his death becomes in front of the camera so i mean this creates a bit of it, it creates i would say a, a piece of film or like a new genre it's very difficult to put in a very specific perspective i mean it is a propaganda film it's an output of a criminal terrorist organization, but at the same time has documentary elements and elements of, uh, let's say, something they would say like uh, shock horror films or even snuff films in a way. It's very weird. And it exists also, also in a bit of an ideological vacuum. I mean, it's not something that we, we can very easily let's say, describe it. And I mean, for example, this is the last piece of the film, which I think is very interesting because it's, you have this uh, glacier-like landscape. In the end, you have this like very religious message that is like, may Allah accept him. And it's also interesting because you pass through this very warlike rhetoric 
to something that is much more mellow in a sense, or it all feels much more normal, much more poetic. And this contrast is always something that was interesting. And what I tried to do was like to present this whole like thing as an installation to one particular point. I think what I tried to do is like to take a series of images and present it in a single, in a very single, in a very small space. And the whole, all, all the books images are played in this like video, a light show, and there's this small like series of images that basically try to narrate the history of this particular person. And I, I, I'm trying to do that, although I understand there's a difference, there's a distance. I'm distant, I'm not from Syria, I'm not from that place. But one of the ideas that I had that I found very interesting was like some of these videos basically were like, uh, in a way, they were referring to like young or middle-aged white men. They were in English, most of the propaganda videos that I have found. And they were like trying to convince people like me. Okay, I'm very against that, but I mean, generally as an idea to come and join this cause. And I mean, then again, again, there, you can find some reference to yourself, although you are somewhere very far. And also there were videos that were made for you to see them online, which I think this is a very interesting subject by itself. Now, uh, wait a minute for one. Uh, no, it doesn't work, sorry. Okay, there's the book. If we have time, we can see it afterward because I don't think we will have time now. One of the other artists that I could say that they have been always been an influence is Christian Boltanski. If you don't, he's he's a late French artist that works a lot of installations related with photography, and some of the installations have to do with memory. In this particular piece, he has combined in the same like. Uh, sort of massive installations, portraits of people that either they have been killed or they have been accused of murder and they have done it all together. And I'm showing this piece because the next work I'm going to show has also a reference in one of his works. Uh, going uh, a bit further than actually like the idea of uh, always looking about the events and things like that, or for example, a more uh, what we say cinematic narrative. I try to find some new meanings by combining first photographs that I took myself, photographs I found, and second, trying to, to speak more about space or about what photography can describe or the space that is described within a photography. In that sense, I exhibition through a series of photographs that basically the, great, the, the idea is that there is always a space of death that we could say, I mean, we can find it, that's all, it's always reappearing in our history around the world. And there's always a, an inability or a difficulty in photography describing these things. And what I mean by space of death is a space that's related to things like uh, violence, genocide, uh, uh, cultural extermination, things like that. And for me, one of like, uh, what I found interesting, I found a very interesting text about, uh, that is basically a description by my, from Michael Tasswing, which he is like a, a prominent anthropologist, that there is basically, there's a description by a, uh, a Brazilian, uh, in, uh, native, um, uh, native Indian, indigenous shaman that he describes that when he travels, there is this space that he can never describe. It has, it's a space of death, but it's also like a space of healing, but it's also a space of death. It has no west, uh, no south, no north, no, no east. So, I mean, it's this space that you cannot really describe. And I tried that to like transform it through like a photographic exhibition. So this, the first work of my, of this exhibition is like this, uh, 
It's a self-portrait, basically. It's called monumental self-portrait. And basically, it is a self-portrait that I took in one of Christian Boldarki's work. The work is not obvious because it's like a reflective surface, but I mean, it works a bit like as a reference. And the main pieces of the work, basically, that these uh, two spaces, that they are, they are part of the Jewish Museum in Berlin, is uh, the Libeskin actually like a memorial he has made, that there are these like uh, completely dark spaces that you walk in and you can, the door closes and you are in this, you are inside this completely dark space with all the only light coming from above. And I was there basically, to be honest, as a tourist, didn't know what I was going to see. And suddenly, And you can see always only traces of people in the space. And one image that I also had in this like uh, series, also as a reference to the text, is one image that I, I took from a book that it shows like a series of native uh, indigenous people in Brazil that they are in front of like of one of their traditional homes that these people are no longer exist as part, because they were exterminated as part of like uh, the latex genocide, which was a, a series of extermination of native people in order to, in order to make them basically walk to death in order to extract latex, natural latex. And this is how these works are presented in space. These are, they are two meters high, two and a half meters high, and three meters long, they are very, very, they're huge, basically. And they were shown in an art space that was very industrial like. As you see, these are like basically, they are like wallpapers. They don't have any framing, and the other wall space is framed. And this work, which also exists as a book, which is part of the same exhibition, is a series of composite portraits that they have done that they are basically a reference to the, to the history of Magshot. It's a combination of photos that they were taken in concentration camps and photos that they were taken in uh, Greek uh, police, uh, 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 how say, in Greek police Magshots. And if you turn them black and white and you put one next to the other, they are very similar. They are almost people are photographed exactly in the same way from the 1860s, the 40s to today. And it doesn't matter if they're like uh, people that are in a death camp or they're just uh, like uh, in a police department. And I think this thing says a lot about the perils of our world, like even, I mean, that we carry on with the same procedures all along. It seems like that the, the possibility of something horrible happening again is always there. I mean, it's like, again, a space of death can always present itself again. And the one, the last the work I'm going to show is a, a work that's still in progress that's called In Every Home and basically is a series of artworks that I'm developing right now that are based on the personal files of Osama Bin Laden which I don't know if many people know it a, a very big amount of them they are basically a public archive through the site of the CIA you can download them and it's very weird because they are like basically the contains, the edited contains of its computer. And they are basically like 300 gigabytes of documents and uh, images that they raise from video games that you can find inside them 
generic uh, GIFs, uh, generic photos from programs, uh, videos that are related to terrorist acts, uh, video games, uh, letters that he has written to his family or his friends, family photos. It's a very complex and weird, like uh, corrupt files, viruses. It's a very weird, the, the whole thing, because it's kind of like, it's not only like that, it's like, uh, let's say, an archive of a famous, like, politically controversial figure or a terrorist, but it's also like an archaeology of computer, like, uh, media. Because, I mean, it's, imagine it's already 10 years old, this archive, and the computer was, all, was already old. I mean, you have almost like seeing again the contents of a similar computer to yours, like 10 years or 12 years ago. And for me that I am a bit older, some of these files seem familiar. And it's a very weird material, which I, I, I must admit is always very difficult to work with. And also it's very difficult to present it. I mean, do you make, uh, what are the contents, who it belongs to, no? Do you, you don't that? Is it, there are things that are completely like uh, resolved in my head or in my practice. One piece that I have already shown as part of an exhibition, it was part of an exhibition that I had curated myself uh, together a good exhibition with other artists that it was called The Infernal Machine. And these pictures were part actually of his... Uh, they are unedited pictures, part of his hard drive, that basically they were crafted images that were found in his Photoshop file. But these are basically, they were images that they were like, uh, they were like uh, default images that they came with earlier versions of Photoshop, basically. So, I mean, uh, and I think this is this was very interesting because what he was creating is, uh, wait a minute, this possibility that, I mean, you have something in common, but at the same time, these images, because they are corrupted, you see that there are all these, like, uh, they are sort of, uh, they're not proper, they have not properly downloaded. I mean, they also, like, have this sense that somebody has meddled with them, or they could be like a, a result of an explosion or something. So, I mean, I like this idea very much. And also that you could find very easily a common ground to an everyday computer. And one other very interesting aspect is the photos that Bin Laden have made himself. And I have chosen some photos, that, although some of them might be a bit off. Maybe I don't know if he can recognize it very uh, interesting or not, I don't know, there's no commentary about that, but it's the, the photos he have made himself, which is, again, it's a very interesting idea, because, I mean, there's also like this, I was reading about this uh, theory about Boris Groys, which says, like, we all know first time Bin Laden as a video maker, as someone who used the same media as I do as an artist. So, I don't say that he was or he is an artist, but I mean, it's kind of like, is there this common ground how you can connect? How do you associate with that? If it was not known by whom he was made, was this interesting or not? A pause. Hello. Also, okay, are we- Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to give you a couple minute warning. We're almost at five. So I don't know if you want to start looking for a natural, like an ending point. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm basically finished. There was also another video that I, I, it's not necessary to show that because basically it's not ready, I would say. Well, I can see a couple of images, perhaps. Sorry, more. Wait a minute. No, it's not working now. And this is another two images that I'm making right now. One of them is, this is called like a history of terrorism that tries to combine historical elements of, uh, let's say this is image, if you see it in front, it's like a, of the terrorist uh, attack in Monarch, the Monarch massacre in 72. 
and combine it with some uh, digital combine with some material from Bindlad and like PC and try to see if we can I can make something interesting. Try to both like or combine various histories in one image, and this is something that has to do like with how, in a sense, like uh, it's more about the theory of like uh, the so-called field of terrorist studies or counter-terrorist studies. How do they define terrorism themselves? So I have combined the different ideas that they have in diagrams into the same image and, and may, digitally made it reproduce itself so it creates this chaotic image and but these are more like research projects still and i'm not finished with them yet so basically this is i would say a very big part of my work sorry for being so tiring speaking almost like one hour without stop Hope you find some of it interesting, and I'm very open to questions and whatever you like. And... Wonderful, and I don't think we're tired at all. Thanks, Apostolos. <laughs> um, I thank you again for your patience. Oh, of course, yes, no, it was wonderful. Um, I do want to give an opportunity if anybody has a, a question they'd like to pose, especially since we have a whole classroom with us here today. If anybody wanted to pose a question, um, feel free to unmute and ask, or if you want to type it in the chat, I can read it out to people, but I just want to make, leave a little bit of space and time there in case anybody had a reflection or a, a question. Oh yeah, I see somebody pointing. <laughs> yeah, this is... There's that many gestures happening in the classroom. <laughs> yeah, but I, I like this pointing sounds a bit like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Rick. <laughs> I think they're working. Hi, Ellen. There we oh, go. Yeah. I can hear you. Good to see you. Yeah. Uh, so um, we don't have any questions. Uh, so I, I want to thank you for your presentation today. We actually didn't finish our final critique of the semester today. So we actually have to. Um, uh, leave you at this point, and I'm sorry that we have to, but um, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with us today. It was really interesting. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. That's there. Okay, uh, so we're actually going to uh, take off. We got to finish critique, and Ellen, I want to thank you for arranging this for today. Uh, it was really great. Wonderful. We're so glad you could make it. And I see Jesus has turned on his camera, so he'll. I think he might ask us a question. Yay. All right. We're, we're logging you. out. Thank you. You bet. Bye. <laughs> Hi, Jesus. Hi. Hi, Apostolos. Thank you for Hello. the talk. Um, I, have, um, I have a question. Like, I have, yeah. So, uh, in all the works that you have shown us today, there's like a constant visual narrative related to the enrichment of the photos, like through noises or glitches or pixels of like some elements that you add there in all your work. Um, so my question is that, uh, does these elements come from the conception, like your, when you start like thinking about the project or is more like an explorative process when you're like taking the photo or like revealing it or, exposing it basically this is a very interesting question it is both in a way because sometimes it seems that i have a more clear pathway like to what how i works like oh i will do this for example the one with the t-shirts i mean and the people i photographed was like no today i'm going to be a real photographer so i'm going to photograph people you know I mean, it was almost sometimes also like an exercise to yourself but many times, a lot, like in post-production, although in sometimes the post-production might be very simple. It might have nothing to do with uh, like a lot of like uh, added elements. But I mean, usually until I reach there, like uh, experimented a lot. For example, the one, the, the black ones, the very big ones. Right? So, I mean, th there's not really any like uh, real digital production behind it just i just uh opened the raw file in order to like 
make the image appear like someone will do in a like dark room and this effect of like all this uh, noise came up because it was just too dark there so, so but I, I think i'm always experimenting with that and to be honest in the future i'm thinking also like of turning back a bit for at least a project to a film like or something like that to, to see this element coming back in because although I, I like the digital i mean I think, in a way, it might be interesting, especially through the passage of time, to see that. But I'm, I'm generally have a very open process towards that. It's more like an experimental that uh, do try this and that and see how it goes. It's not I'm already fixed. I don't know if you discovered uh, yeah, that yes, a lot. Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for that question, Jesus. I wonder if anybody else has any questions. And if not, that's okay too. I understand that yeah. some people yeah. might have back-to-back -back meetings to head out to their five o'clock appointments and so forth. So, but I'm glad we got yeah, at yeah. least one question in there and such an interesting one about process. So that's really great. Um, I wanna thank Apostolos and thank all of you for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate your time and um, we hope that uh, you have a beautiful evening, or in your case, uh, all the folks. Yeah, from I will have a good sleep. Sleep. Uh, <laughs> I will thank everybody who was uh, who, who took one hour of its life to devote to hearing me talk about my work. It was a pleasure of inviting me. Thank you, Ellen, very much. You have been so helpful for all these things. I, I have also to thank my students that they have, or these people from Greece that they have stayed up so late, and. Uh, I won't complain them for them tomorrow, you know, if they're late, there's no problem. Okay, you know what I mean? They're dismissed. And uh, also some friends that they are watching right now, and I know. So thank you, everybody. And Ellen will keep in touch. And Absolutely. Absolutely. Speak again soon. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. That's great. It was really nice. Thank Have a good much. evening. <laughs> Bye. Bye.